Hello, and welcome back to Pillars of Eternity. You just missed one of the scariest moments of my life, because for about 45 seconds, there was a... It just said, loading, like, loading save data, and I was so scared. I was terrified. I was like, my god, if Thorn's file has been corrupted, I'm gonna be so sad. But, it's all good. We're fine. Let's just get back into it. So, we've got some backer characters. As you near, you feel a vibrant history containing the essence of this woman's soul. Voices from its past seem to call out to you. You know, maybe... Maybe starting off the video... Somebody might have clicked this randomly. Starting off the video with reading this wall of text from a backer character isn't the best way to hook in viewers. I would argue... The sort of viewers who are going to be bored by that aren't going to like this Let's Play. You see a woman clad in expensive finery. Her eyes flash as she interrogates a trembling wreck on the ground. Reaching into his pocket, her hand curls around an address, and she smiles grimly. Moments later, she is in a bedraggled alleyway, her pace quickening. Her braids trail around a corner, and she is upon them. Or perhaps they are upon her. The action does not last as she easily dispenses of man after man searching their faces, clothes, shouts for something she fails to find. Frustrated, she moves on, but not quickly enough as an Orlin attacks her from behind, the seal upon his finger glittering with malice. The woman's eyes alight upon it as she twists to evade his blow, and her eyes burn bright. Perhaps this was not a wasted trip after all. That'd be Vic Victor. As you near, you feel a vibrant history containing the essence of this man's soul. Voices from its past seem to call out to you. You see a large group of people gathered in the common area of a large inn. This man is standing in the midst of the people, engaged in conversation with someone. He is smiling and talking gregariously, moving from person to person with ease. He is able to extract himself from one conversation and insert himself into another without a break in his stride. He kisses the hand of a well-dressed woman, dipping her then twirling her back into the arms of her escort. He moves on to another group, slapping someone on the back while laughing at a joke, and then he's off again, sliding between people, hugging someone, shaking hands. He never stops. Finally, he seems to have hit his limit and he excuses himself from the gathering, much to the dismay of everyone there. He smiles and waves as he leaves, making a little bow with a flourish of the hand as he closes the door. Once he is away from the inn and around a corner, he pulls several objects from a concealed pocket in his jacket. He looks at each one in turn. A necklace, a brooch, a couple of coin pouches, and a small jewel. Smiling, he pours the money into his palm and quickly counts it, still aimlessly wandering the streets. He passes a beggar who holds out a bowl to him, pleading for a pittance. The man stops, smiles at the beggar, and drops all the coins into his bowl. Then he walks off, whistling happily. The oven smells of roast game hen and baking bread. What's down here? I've never been down here. New map for me. Uh-oh. This, uh... Uh-oh. Hi. The proprietor has collected a respectable variety of bottles from around the world. From tart adire reds to sweet summer wines of Rawatai. Pale yellow and deep amber whiskies from the deerwood and the living lands are side by side. Flasks of the infamous Soul Burn of the Deadfire Archipelago are nestled next to crystal clear Nasataki and Glamfelon spirits. What's Glamfelon again? I forget. It sounds Glamfathon, but I don't know. Who are you? I'm having a little chat with my associates. Okay. You'll probably be important later. You're a special tool that can help us later. Or maybe not. With pillars, you never know. Those bandits might just be flavor. Heartless bitch. The young elf is dressed in gaudy robes that he seems ready to cast off. He picks at a heavily brocaded sleeve and continually adjusts the gold chain around his neck. He picks at a heavily brocaded sleeve and continually adjusts the gold chain around his neck. He looks up at you. Did she send you to run me out of town? You can tell her I'm not going anywhere without that medallion. 
I told Sorel I wouldn't let her sell it. If that's what you're here about, then save yourself the trouble. He puffs up his chest, but glances at the exit. I have a lot of trouble with Fs because of, um... I'm missing a particular configuration of teeth that make Fs and Vs, uh, kind of tough. What are you talking about? He relaxes. If you have to ask, then you're obviously not here to shake me down. Sorel's a courtesan over at the Salty Mast in Andra's Gift. We've been working together for over a year now. I find a noble with more money than sense, fill him up with liquor, and send him her way. They have a good time, and Sorel takes her fee. And a little extra. He rubs his fingers together. A hundred coppers here, a trinket there. It's a bounty for us, and these lords and ladies never notice anything missing. No harm done, then. Anyway, we always split the bounty. Until a week ago. He squeezes his lips into a tight frown. She takes a necklace off of some noble. It's an Anguithan medallion, damn near priceless. That relic is sacred to my clan, but she won't part with it for any sum I could afford. He tugs at the gold chain around his neck. And even if I wanted to, I can't go home without it. I'll see about getting the medallion from Sorel. You'll find her at the Salty Mast. The only way anyone sees her these days is by paying. So you'll have to go through Maya. He fidgets with his sleeve. But whatever you do, please don't hurt her. Let me look at the stage. The scripts and props belong to a production of The Most Unfortunate Tale of Favia and Bernat. Okay, um, I think that's it for here. Oh, we didn't go upstairs. Fuck. Later, later. We'll have to come back anyway to talk to Thirstwind. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Anytime, anytime it's like, hey, look at this Glen Fath and I'm like, ah, fuck. If it's more complex than Haravius, I ain't getting it. I can take a stab, but it ain't gonna sound good. Your brother. Did you and he get along? We got along how brothers do. He used to throw water on me to wake me up in the morning. I used to fill his boots with stinging ants. My own brothers and sisters are doing very well for themselves, back in Tokoa. I don't know that they'd search for me if I were killed so far from home. Brothers can be funny. I bet you'd be surprised how far they'd go. I just realized that's what Adair threatens to do <laughs> to the Watcher. I mean, you know, you know, some people have crushes on characters. I have like a sibling crush on Adair. I wish he was my big brother. Hey, what's that? The mortared stone wall is sheltered by the eaves. A knotty green vine climbs all the way up to an open window. Two ornate shutters seem to beckon you in. Absolutely not. Maybe later. I've never been in there. What's in there? I know I mentioned that I played this game, and I did try to do, like, every side quest I came across, but exploring video games isn't in my instincts. My instinct is to just do whatever anyone tells me, S just single-minded single, single on whatever quest is put in front of me, get that finished, move on to the next one. I always miss all this side content. Now, who's this? Probably not supposed to be in here, but... I'll absolutely get in trouble if I steal. I'm mostly looking for books. It's a play. The Light of Dawn, a Red Sail and Morality play. Part 1. Charity and Generosity, I think that says. It's really tiny from here. Characters, in order of appearance. Man. Male, a ghostly being. Female, a ghostly being. Beggar, starving man, injured man. This sounds like a very simple morality play. Setting. Empty field. No trees or buildings in sight. A man lies on the ground center stage. He wakes slowly and looks around. Two ghostly beings approach him. A male from stage left. A female from stage right. Where am I? What has happened? Nothing has happened. How did I get here? You did not arrive. You were just here. What is going on? You are traveling. We will travel with you. So it's going to be a conscience thing. You know, devil on your shoulder, angel on your shoulder. They both reach out a hand to him, insistently. He looks at them, not sure what to do. After a few moments of deliberation, he takes Mail's hand and allows him to help. If they're ghosts, how are they helping someone stand up? Maybe it's supposed to be more of a, you know, the soul is outside of the body, interacting with the spirit world kind of thing. His soul is strong. This decision will be easy. Such arrogance will surely be your undoing. 
They walk to the end of the stage and encounter a beggar, holding out a bowl. Will you help the needy? Will you hear the call of charity? What will you do for those less fortunate? Here is a beggar. What will you do? He has no food, no clothes. He is destitute and will surely die if no mercy is shown to him. Surely he deserves no mercy. Look to his legs. Do they not move? Look to his arms. Can they not work? Look to his eyes. Can they not see? Surely he can provide for himself. What will you do? The man ponders for a moment, then reaches into his pocket and drops a coin in the beggar's bowl. Thank you, kind sir. May your charity come back to you in turn. Why did you give alms to this beggar? I saw a man in need. It is not for me to say if he deserves mercy, only that I need provide mercy if I am able. I have the means to help, so I help. If he has the ability to provide for himself and does not, that is on his head, not mine. If I can provide the light of dawn to a man in need, it is my duty to do so. He knows charity, even disguised as a beggar. His mind is open. Even those with an open mind can be closed down. Let us continue our journey. They walk to the other edge of the stage, leaving the beggar behind. They approach the starving man, who puts out his hands in supplication. A crust, a morsel, please. Surely generosity will not allow you to stand by and let someone starve. This man is starving. What will you do? He is on the brink of death. Only an act of generosity will save him. What need has this man that he cannot provide for himself? Why should you turn over that which you earn to one who has done no such act and who deserves nothing from you? What will you do? Again, the man considers what he will do. He reaches into his pocket and retrieves a piece of bread and gives it to the starving man. Thank you. Thank you, good sir. May your generosity be returned unto you tenfold. Why did you give food to the hungry? I saw a man who hungered. It is not for me to say if he deserves a morsel, only that I need provide a morsel if I am able. I have the food to spare, so I give. If I can open a man's eyes to the light, it is my duty to do so. He knows generosity, even disguised as a starving man. His heart is giving. Even those with a giving heart can be greedy. We will continue our journey. I like the arguments that they posit, because it is more mature than just like, oh, you, you, gotta, you gotta give to people who are, who are hurt. You got you, you got to give to people who are hungry, who, who need help. It, it's the it's the sort of like anti welfare queen mentality is what the female ghost is espousing here. You know, oh he can walk, he can see, he could work. When she doesn't know, N you know, none of them know. Only the beggar actually knows what the beggar can and can't do. He may have a hidden disability or be unable to find work in a certain area, depending on things like social status. At, education, race, stuff like that. I do enjoy that. It's interesting, too, that it's Red Saren, because in Red Saris, they, like, slavery is legal. And it's interesting to find it in what appears to be a house of a noble, something about generosity and giving. I wonder if the second part has him turn greedy, maybe? I don't know. I'm excited to see. Sprigs of dried lavender and rosemary infuse the kitchen with a fresh aroma. The skins are so bright and red. It looks as if someone has taken the time to polish each fruit individually. Is there more books? Is there part two? Is part two in here? Oh, there's a guy. Um, hi. There's my pig. I know he's in your house. What's in here? A deer eye clothing. Ah, oh, he's a deer and do Don't that. pick that. Don't What's pick that. He's right wrong? there. The ledgerless quantities of wheat, copper, and wire wool. Weir wool? I'm not sure. A deep crease along the spine suggests that the book never closes. Hi. How do you do? He's gonna yell at us. Lord Raymond holds a shipping manifest in his well-manicured hands. Despite his expensive clothes, he has the sallow complexion and restless air of a man who devotes all of his days and most of his nights to work. If you have business to discuss, make an appointment with my attendant. I don't have time for unexpected visitors. Tell me you about yourself. <laughs> he snaps the pages in his hands. I am lord of this house and not prone to idle chatter. If you have no business here, I suggest you be off. He doesn't look up from his papers. Did I look here? Yeah, we're... I'm all for stealing from the rich, I just don't feel like getting yelled at. Hi, who are you? Father never reads to me. He's always busy with his own books. You should check out my Let's Play, there's a lot of reading. I read that play that's in there. The labels. 
all perfectly angled outward, boast an array of fine vintages. However, they're all coated in dust. Is this the Dominels? That's a very dominell -y hat. Is this something to do with them? The old serving woman regards you with bleary eyes. Begging your pardon, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to return downstairs. Visitors aren't permitted on the upper floor. I'll just leave then. These are there, There's no option to, like, charm her. It's just, you know, Paul Blart 2, an elderly woman, or attack her. I've never seen Paul Blart 2. I've only listened to Dit Till Death Do Us Blart. Don't, don't think I'm the sort of person who watches Paul Blart. Please. <sighs> now, have we talked to this person? I think so, yeah. Jalista the Palzerker. Stobart. Pals, like... Paladin Berserker. That's fun. Yes, with the Zarep and the books. But did we talk to White Brows? Did we talk to the White Boys? Did we talk to Timothy Whitewater? We didn't. Ah, uh, this sounds uncomfortable. You see this man kneeling naked before a day in the center of a large room. Deus? I don't know. Across the room, opposite from where he kneels, stands a large throne. The throne's back and two of its legs are broken, rendering it unusable and causing it to tilt precariously on its stand. The room is ringed with figures clad in black robes, each chanting quietly, resulting in a low drone that pervades the room. On the dais, across the brazier, is another robed figure holding a leather-bound book with charred marks on it. He is speaking to the naked man about fealty, dedication, and law. When he finishes, he bids the other to rise and holds the book out to him over the burning coals in the brazier. The naked man nods and the road man drops the book into the fire. The naked man drops to one knee, briefly pressing his forehead to the side of the brazier, then stands and thrusts both of his hands into the coals at the bottom of the brazier. He retrieves the book, slowly presenting it to the robed figure before him. The man rubs his thumb on the ash that is collected on the cover of the book and uses it to draw a mark on the naked man's forehead over the burned flesh. The naked man bows his head and whispers, Was that right, Da? The robed man nods patiently. The naked man looks to the broken throne with childlike eyes. Did you see that, Mum? And the other white boy? Rocco Francis Whitebrows? You see a burly man inspecting a dilapidated inn. The Amaua sail has been almost dwarfing him as they walk through the once proud establishment. The walls are rife with stains, and while only knows what else, smeared on every available surface. Not one thing stands unbroken, and moth eaten blankets, rotting food, and trash give evidence to a succession of squatters. Moths don't actually eat blankets, it's that some of their larvae, but not all their larvae. There's your moth fact for the day, you're welcome. Do not expect any more. The man frowns, scrutinizing the space. The Amaua gives him a final offer flashing two white teeth with each syllable, oversized and threatening. Their teeth are pointy, don't forget. With a sigh and a jingle as he hands over the coin pouch, the man acquires the dump of an inn and begins to plan. Oh, there's a building. I haven't been in there. Have I? I don't think so. We're just, like, harassing nobles. No, we said we were going to do quests. There isn't so much as a spot on these oranges. I probably read that before. We said we're going to do quests. We'll do quests. What? Is that Audra? Wow. I have never noticed that before. It's always just been here, over there, down there, and gone. I've never sat and looked. Wow. That's that's cool. That's cool. There's these big, huge chunks of Audra. Did we talk to Nedin? Let me check. No, we haven't talked to you. I think? Greetings. A woman stands in the shade of the garden muttering to herself. She's fixated on the pages of a large and well-worn tomb, seemingly oblivious to the blooming flowers and the cool, fragrant breeze. She only looks up when your shadow crosses her page. Do you mind? I'm rather busy. What are you so busy with? She snaps her book shut. I'm studying soul attachment. We all know that souls move into people at birth and out of them at death, but we still have a lot of questions about what makes them stick, so to speak. What do you mean, making them stick? She brushes a stray lock from her forehead. Souls power bodies and give their tissues life, but only when they're firmly attached. It's separation that leads to a whole spate of soul-related ailments, including the hollowborn. But if we understood how to reattach souls, we could end Widewind's legacy. Maybe even conquer death. She scratches behind her ear. That's the theory, anyway. 
Unfortunately, I don't have all the research I need to put it into practice. What exactly do you need? There's a manuscript called The Theorems of Pangram. It contains research from Pangram's experiments on detached souls. The Hall of Revealed Mysteries is rumored to have a copy in the Elder Archives. Pangram's work is considered to be one of the more, uh, daring animancy texts. Not something generally circulated among novices, nor easy to get a hold of. I wonder if we might have a peek at it. The theorems could advance my research by leaps and bounds, but Grimda, the High Archivist, the High Arch the High Arch Arch Archivist, I don't hit that word right, I don't know why, worships while, which means she has some paradoxical views on sharing and restricting knowledge. And since she's not exactly a proponent of animancy, she tends to restrict the kinds of information that would be useful to me. That's one of the interesting things about the whole library. Maybe, maybe you, th you thought about it too in the last video. Maybe she could be persuaded. You're welcome to try, but you wouldn't be the first. She sighs. Look at me, spilling my troubles. It's kind of you to listen, but I should really get back to my work. Anything else? She looks eager to return to her studies. Tell you about yourself. I'm an animancer at the sanitarium. Currently, I'm researching matters related to Widewind's legacy. Thorn already knows, but I think you would want to know what she knows about Widewind's legacy. Widewind's legacy refers to the rise in hollowborn children in the Deerwood in recent years. Some have also connected it to so-called Buicks that blow through Air Glanfath. There's hardly any reliable data on those, though, so I can't really comment. She sniffs. I don't have much care for the term Widewind's legacy. It reeks of superstition, but it's too prevalent to change at this point. Personally, I'd like to see people take a more methodical approach to these matters rather than throwing up their hands and blaming the gods. She gets it. Good to hear someone speaking sense on the matter. I'll leave you alone. Farewell. Look at this garden. Again, likening back to... It's not like a whole grounds that they have, really. At least that we can see. We don't know what's back there. But even that kind of likens back to the days when there would be, like, beautiful gardens and the, these, like, well-maintained farms outside of, uh, asylums that were... You know, not something that the patients were allowed to use, really. They'd barely be allowed outside. Or they'd only be allowed to really do, do slave labor, to do field work, the ones that were able-bodied enough. What's in here? Meat. The glistening flesh of some unfortunate creature. No, thank you. I'm afraid of that. Because it's mystery meat. From a box. Don't trust that. Let's get back to the VTC. We might be able to convince him to just back off. That's what I that's what I think Thorn would want to do. You know, ideally. Hey, Verzano. Good day, stranger. Were you able to deliver the package? Yes, but now the Dominels want you dead. The Dominels were there. Verzano's eyes fly open and he tugs at his beard. I was so careful, always following the Verlavita. I don't know how to pronounce that word. I decided it's Latin based. They couldn't have known. Well, well. Is this your last day among the living, Verzano? Verzano wrings his hands. Your timing is impeccable, Taya Palagina. The Dominels are after me. Please, you've got to stop them. As if any of this were ever in my hands. The Republic's considered your business worth protecting based on its success. That success depended on cooperation with the locals, like House Dominel. You've lost that. And the favor of the gods. Pelagina snorts and her golden eyes narrow. Even if you get out of this alive, they're done with you. The dukes have more pressing interest in Defiance Bay than rescuing one merchant who threw himself overboard. Ritsana falls to his knees and clasps his hands together. Have mercy, Palagina. I don't stand a chance against the Dominels. He bites a trembling lip. I've brought failure and shame on myself, but you can't mean to watch your countryman die like a dog. Vezzano, Vezzano. Why are you wasting your precious breath on me? My orders come through the ambassador and through the ambassador from people you should be honored ever gave a moment's thought to whether you live or die. Pelagina stares at Verzano for a long moment. The nicitating membranes of her eyes slide out and back before she continues. I don't know how to pronounce that. Nicitating? Nicitating? I'm not sure. 
You don't seem like the sort to petition the gods to keep him out of hell. So why not cry mercy to the one person in this room with the power to grant it? She turns her attention to you and raises her feathered eyebrows expectantly. I don't think Thorn would do any of this. I think Thorn would help him run. I don't think he'd just leave, but that's the closest I can do to that. So I'm worried... I'm worried about locking us out, because I think there are side quests with the Dominoes I wouldn't know, and I'm worried that if we don't attack him, it'll lock me out. At the same time, I said that I think Thorn would want to help him run. I think he would. At the same time, again, I think Thorn's had his chain yanked by a lot of, like, Valian merchants and nobles. And probably... Th there were so many times where he couldn't say, You're putting me in danger. Fuck you. I'm out of here. Maybe he would, I really think he would, want to try and make sure nobody dies, but that's not an option. So, we'll just say this was a bad day for Thorn. Like, even on a bad day, I can't see him not caring if people die, but you're on your own. I'm leaving. After you pay me what I'm owed. A hard fate, but not unwarranted. Forgiveness. Vrizzano turns his tear-streaked face to you. I know you have a kind heart. Please, I never meant for either of us to come to harm. I only wanted to save my business. Don't let them slaughter me like this. Do as you will. He's no longer my concern. She turns her feathered head in your direction. They're all a bunch of fucking capitalists. I don't think Thorne would care. I think he'd, he'd care in that he doesn't want to see people die. But I, I can't see Thorin being like, yeah, I'm going to go to bat for this rich noble. Actually, this rich noble. I don't think he'd give a shit. Dana saunters through the door, flanked by a squad of Dominel foot soldiers. She lets her gloved hand rest on the hilt of her weapon. I hope you've collected whatever payment you were owed, because there won't be much left of this old fool soon. As you leave the warehouse, you hear Vetsano utter a shriek which is quickly cut off. Does music sound different to you when your ears, or, well, ear, is another shape? Yes, I find it unpleasant. Most everything seems shrill when I'm a Stalgar. Maybe your keen senses just haven't heard truly fine music yet. A masterfully crafted annoyance is still an annoyance. I bet I could make some sounds that Haravius's Stalgar ear would be pleased with. Hi, Palagina. Ah, it's done then. Palagina looks up with a satisfied expression. You did the right thing. Vatsano has no one to blame for this but himself. We gave him more than enough warnings, but he never listened. She shakes her feathered head and smiles faintly. In any case, the embassy's entanglements with him have been cut, which also means that I'm free from Vatsano's net of stupidity. You have my thanks. Whether you intended to or not, you've done the Valian Republics a service today, ridding us of him. I work closely with the Embassy to protect our interests, but lately I think our gaze has been too narrow. You clearly have pursuits of your own in the city, but I think we could help each other out, if you're interested in doing some work for us. Officially, I mean. We can go together and I'll introduce you to the Ambassador. She glances back toward the warehouse and raises her feathered eyebrows. That sounds fine. Let's go. Good. Maybe I can finally do something more worthwhile than playing nanny to merchants. The embassy is up in first fires, southwest of the Ducal Palace. She smiles. I'm excited to go here with a Valian watcher. I don't know if it'll be any different. And again, I'm really interested in there's gonna, if there's going to be any interplay between, an, between the Orlin part and the Valian part. Because of course there would be. Like, in the deep lore, but I mean in the actual dialogue that they've programmed in. Uh, bye. You walk your path, I'll walk mine. We'll, we'll put Durrance back in eventually because we're going to want a priest. But we're going to try it without him for a bit. Especially, swapping him with a paladin is, I think, okay. Because she should have some healing stuff. We'll go with that. Oh, your flames of devotion she has. She needs the healing one. Lay on hands. Absolutely, she needs lay on hands. We'll go with greater lay on hands. Just to make sure we have that 
healing taken care of. Yeah, because she's... Right right now, we're putting her more on healing. So... I I really love the look of her, uh... Her actual character model. I love how you can see her, uh... I think afro would be the right word? It's just like her natural puff of hair and how... I love how it's mixed in with feathers. Instead of just being feathers. Because there is a big issue, especially in fantasy stories. With characters being clearly black. But not actually having textured hair. Instead, just having, you know, feathers or, you know, just just like, I, my feathers is the only one I can come up with. I know I've seen it before. <laughs> feathers, metal, weird shit like that. So I'm glad they actually had the sense to mix it. And I also like um, that she's wearing pants, because she's a fucking paladin and she should be wearing pants. She's also the only uh, black companion in the game, unless you count Kana, which sucks. That sucks. I personally, I, th I think Kana is very clearly black coded, but I think you have the problem. Kana does have a white voice actor, which makes the coding not great. I think Palagina's voice actress is black, but I'm not sure. Did we talk to Quinlan? I think we did. Yes, we did. So we have to find the va This would be the Valiant Embassy. Yep, Valiant Embassy. Oh, book. Galvin Regged. I think we read this already. Did we? I remember his name. Mention the name Reg. I, I, I know I'm not pronouncing it right, I'm sorry. Mention the name Regged in Air Glanfath, and you'll be told stories of a glorious freedom fighter. An Orlin who used his tactical savvy and battle training to protect the Glanfath from the enroaching evil of the invaders in the Deerwood. I love him already. Ask someone in the Deerwood about him, and you'll hear angry retellings of the exploits of an underhanded, dirty-fighting Orlin who terrorized Deerwood and citizens. This conflict is what legends are built on, and Galvin Regged is the stuff of legends. The Broken Stone War began from a misunderstanding between the Glanfathans who lived in the Deerwood and the Adiran colonists who were moving in. Tensions were already high between the two groups as the Adirans claimed land the Glanfathans said they already owned. Add to it the Glanfathans taken and forced into slavery by the Adirans, and it was only a matter of time before something snapped and sent the two groups to war. There was the occasional skirmish or fight between isolated groups, but no real conflict until the Broken Stone War. Whether intentional or not, Adiran farmers, clearing land for their crops, knocked over and destroyed one of the ancient menhirs that dot the countryside. The Glanfathans, who revered the ancient structures in the Deerwood, reacted swiftly and violently, led by a particularly fanatical fang by the name of Regd. While the war was short-lived and the Glanfathans were ultimately not the victors, Regd and his forces were able to eliminate a significant number of colonists. He was part of the fangs! I didn't know, I wouldn't have guessed the fangs. But that was a long time ago. We see the fangs later. I wouldn't have guessed the fangs. After the war ended, Regd was appointed the Galvin, or leader, of the Glanfathan tribes. His leadership skills and prowess in battle earned him the respect of all the tribes of Air Glanfath. Because all the tribes were unified behind him, he was able to move and coordinate their warriors in a way that organized them into such an efficient team, the Adiran colonists lived in fear of his next attack. His name and reputation spread through both lands. Over two years following the Broken Stone War, Regd and his forces, using deception, misinformation, and straightforward guerrilla tactics killed hundreds. The remaining earls sent word to the Fair Koning, saying something must be done before more nobility is killed. But Reg continues to terrorize the colonists, and it seems the campaign will never end. That is, until he encountered Edring Hadret. Such interesting language, again, as I've touched on. Uh, you know, misunderstandings between the Glanfathans and the colonists. The Glanfathans claim to already own the land. You know, it just... They said... They owned it, but who who knows? I mean, they were the only ones living there, and they said it was theirs, but that doesn't mean it was theirs, right? And that is put next to slavery on a wide scale, on just a massive scale for this game. And, you know, they wouldn't have had to worry about destroying a man here if they hadn't been there. And even then, just just as a reminder, the Deerwood was colonized. Because the Adirans wanted, I believe it was fruit. It might have been something for cloth. I think it was fruit. 
and they didn't have enough space to keep up with the, with the demand. It wasn't that they were starving or they were desperate for space in general. They wanted more farms to make more luxury goods. There was no need for them to be there. Ambassador Agosti, I would speak with you on a matter of some urgency and great importance. Palagina smiles broadly when she addresses the ambassador, sighing as though remembering some heavy burden. Vicente crosses his arms before replying. Palagina, if this is the same matter we previously discussed, I doubt I will be convinced any more easily. I don't think Thorne would know what they're talking about. I think he'd just be quiet until he knows what's going on. Ambassador, I implore you to take a step back and look at this again. Ambassador Agosti holds up his hands and cuts Palagina off in a strident tone. Enough. We're not going over to find Bay's animancers again. The Duke Bell's desires have not changed since the last time we spoke. If you haven't heard, word of your insubordination has already found the ears of the Duquesa of Biagipe and the Duke of Salona. There are murmurs that you cannot be trusted to fulfill your duties. Must this talk reach the shores of Spirento? Palagina's aggressive demeanor drains to a state of shock and worry, but she remains silent. If it makes any difference, Ambassador, I'm already looking into the matters Palagina has spoken of. It doesn't, but it would be fortuitous if your investigation took you to Twin Elms, because that's where Palagina needs to go. What is it the Duke's need of me, Ambassador? Palagina recovers her determined demeanor. The Deerwood's instability has created an opportunity for us to take over their trade with Air Glanfath. Thorin's ears went up. His fur is prickling up just a little bit. Not just because, wow, he wants to go home, but because, ah, oh, fuck, what are these assholes going to do to Air Glanfath? We will need to meet with the Glenfathans soon to secure upcoming trade arrangements. The roads to Twin Elms can be dangerous, of course, but that's why you'll be our representative there. It's Josie, Ambassador, but won't this provoke the dear Woodens? Their country is falling apart, and we are already dividing up their trade alliances. Palagina's feathers ruffle, but she speaks with an unusually meek timber. Provoke them into what? Going to war? Through no fault of the Republic's, the Deerwood's armies have been deprived of an entire generation of soldiers. It would be foolish not to take advantage of the situation. If we don't, the Red Sarens will. Ambassador, that's some cold compassion considering what these people have been through. More than that, Ambassador, there is a practical element to consider. We may profit in the short term from this arrangement, but what of the future? The Deerwood won't forget, and the Republics may pay the price for it. The Ambassador sighs. We're not the Dukes, Palagina. It's their decision and our job to carry out the orders. It's not like they're asking you to assassinate someone. Palagina raises an eyebrow and clenches her jaw, but remains silent. Palagina, Palagina. He shakes his head. Go to Twin Elms. Speak to the Anamenfath. Impress upon her the instability of the Deerwood, and reassure her of the Valiant Republic's desire to open safe trade. Of course, Ambassador. After a long and uncomfortable pause, Palagina exhales deeply, the lids of her eyes closing briefly as she slumps in acceptance. The Ambassador nods and smiles paternally. He then looks to you. I know you planned on investigating this crisis together, but I hope you understand Palagina's responsibilities. He winks obnoxiously at Palagina and says, I understand completely and will make sure she completes this important mission for the Dukes. Vicent bristles and turns to Palagina. Will the Dukes need to hear more about Palagina Masray's wild adventures? Of course not, Ambassador. I will attend to the unamend path as soon as I am able to travel to Twin Elms. Palagina holds up her hands. Good. Now, if you'll excuse me. Could have gone better. Could have gone worse. I appreciate that you stood up for me. But it's hard to persuade the ambassador to go against the duke's orders. I know you're right, Palagina. We may find a way for you to fulfill your obligations while looking into what's really going on around here. Don't worry. Enough wisdom for both of us. Now, I just need to find out how to get to Twin Elms before the Ambassador loses his patience. She pauses in thought. Still, 
I fear that making this deal with the Glenfathans will further weaken the Deerwood and make trouble for the Republics in the years to come. Well, it's a long way to Twin Elms. We'll have plenty of time to think it over. Verus. She nods and sighs. Now, are there more books? There must be more books. Look at this place. It's books, books, books. Book City. A new book. We haven't read the first part. We're not going to steal it. We're not going to steal it. We're going to come back. We're going to make a note. The postings show current prices for a range of commodities, and they track the running exchange rate for the Valian Luce... Luce? Luce? I'm not sure. Spread across the table are the blueprints of an in-progress trade deal between a merchant company from the Republic and a deer wooden wire wool collective. Weir? We it, mu it must be weir. The flag depicts the symbol of the Valen Republics, a ship sailing beneath five radiant stars. I'll tinker with that. He can't. What could go wrong? You can't open it. I love you. You're not going to be able to open that. It's like skill five. We have no picks. I have to buy more picks. I will. Book. Selected correspondence of Giftbringer Eden. Sing, O ocean waves, of Andra's sorrow of her unrequited love for the unattainable moon. Sing of the ocean's sorrow so that we may forget our own. Each day, the tides reenact Andra's longing for the great moon. The waters reach out at high tide, yearning for the heavenly body, only to slump into low tide when the moon proves unattainable. You asked me once why I loved Andra so dearly, how I could go from a life on dry land to being a devotee to the goddess of the oceans. I sing of the ocean's sorrow so that I may forget my own. It is Andra's message that speaks to my heart. I have devoted my life to helping others discard painful memories, for that is the gift Andra gave me. When I lost my young daughter, my wife and I were inconsolable until a gift-bearer offered to take my toddler's toys and cast them into the deepest waters. Truth be told, I and the other gift-bearers I know have never even spoken to Andra. She is largely silent, and when she does speak, she uses floods and tidal waves instead of words. But we sing of the ocean's sorrow so that others may forget theirs. Andra's story, the story of desire unanswered, actually matters to people like you and me. Magrin cannot steer you to victory over sadness. Hylia cannot force joy down a crying throat. Only Andra can give us the strength to persevere when life seems without worth. And that is the answer to your question regarding why I love my goddess so dearly. We need more picks, and then you can then you can break in there, buddy. I bet you'd love to do that, Hera. How do I leave? Ah, the doorway. Doors usually get you in and out of rooms. What else can we work on a bit? We could try the asylum again. Because that's... It's not right. Regular folk like us should be allowed to attend the hearings. You do know there's not enough space in there for everybody, right? Alright, you know what? I haven't had a fight in, what, like a like a month's worth of videos? Unless I change my upload schedule? So, we'll take another stab at Brackenberry. We've had a couple level ups, and we have a new party member. Even though Durance is really helpful there. Honestly, it might be best to switch out Kana um, for Durance. Just while we... Great fetching feathers, lass. Repeat these <laughs> in Adirin. And stand closer so I can grab your neck if you said what I think you did. Th that was Isselmere. She likes your feathers. Thanks, but I'm not interested, Isselmere. I hate that about Pelagina. She's like the, the one character who doesn't seem to believe Aloth, and it pisses me off so much books in here. It's fine. We'll come back. We can come back to the asylum. We will come back. We'll read all the books. I love reading the books. There's a novel. There's a novel, and I would love to read it to everyone. I was thinking maybe, like, between this and the sequel, we'll go over the, uh, content. I have, like, the extra content. Because I got this for free off of Epic way back when. And it is like the digital deluxe edition or whatever it's called. Let's uh let's let's No no 
Why, where did I get a fancy gun? Oh. Sorry, a little more reading. Wow. Ah. Keel was a constable in the small Deerwooden village of Maiden Falls. A good man who fulfilled his duties honorably. He often found himself in violent confrontations, with passing ruffians and mercenaries come to the village to exploit the nearby ruins. Wiry, with a boyish face and an awkward gait. Offenders rarely took Ka'il seriously. I thought that was an accident, that first apostrophe, that's why I said it Keel, but I think it's Ka'il. They would mock him, telling him there was no way he was going to take them to jail. You're right, Keel would reply. I bring forgiveness. Scary. Scary cop, scary cop. Likes his gun too much. Don't love that. Anyway, let's see if we die. What did I say last time? Because I'm looking at these and I feel like the second option is better than the first for Thorn. I believe we share a common past. I'm just looking for some answers. Yeah, I don't think it matters. Hey, okay, that's the one that's supposed to be there. I thought there was a, a an extra one wandering in somehow. I was pissed, just a little bit pissed. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I would love to uh, turn the camera. I understand why that can't be done. I know what isometric I'm means, here. but. I would still love to do it. Thorn's gonna go over there. How may I Alos gonna go over there. Did I think Kana was the only Amawa in the Deerwood? Because that's not how that works. Not how that works at all. Did he not... Why is he not spirit shifting? Shit. I'm ready. Did that not heal her? Why did that not heal her? It sounds like it should have healed her. God damn it. We're gonna- we're- we're, we're gonna die. I mean, I'm- I'm trying, man, but... Order. Fuck it. We're gonna die anyway. Putrefy them! Bye, Kana. Yes? Wow, look at all those. Deep wounds, deep wounds, deep wounds, deep wounds. Blinded, blinded. Well, this was fun. You can see why I like the reading best now, right? I'm not trying to be an asshole and not do anything here, but my god, it's just Thorn and Adair. We tried. Next video is probably just going to be completing some more side quests. Dour note to end on, but the one we're ending on anyway. As always, thank you for watching, and good night.